Hello to everyone watching this lecture on the creation of the Dresden Porcelain Collection. First of all, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Royal Palace in Warsaw for inviting me to this lecture in the context of the opening of the Porcelain Gallery there. And I am delighted to invite everyone who will discover his passion for porcelain in their gallery to come and visit us in Dresden as well. In fact, it was Augustus de Strong, Elector of Saxony, who introduced his proverbial Maladie de Porcelaine or Porcelain Disease as elected King of Poland-Lithuania in the early 18th century. Actually, the story of the reinvention of porcelain in Saxony has been told many times and it's well worth doing so. I hope to give you one or two new perspectives on it today and I also want to give you some insights behind the scenes of the Meissen Porcelain Manufactory and the Porcelain Collection in Dresden. But let me start at the beginning. The establishment of the famous and outstanding Dresden Porcelain Collection was a truly historic achievement. After more than 200 years of vain experimentation all over Europe, it was in Saxony that the alchemist Johann Friedrich Böttger discovered the recipe for making white porcelain. The Europeans were fascinated by the mysterious processes that turned simple clay into gleaming white translucent wares adorned with enduring and brilliant colors, very delicate and at the same time resistant to heat. Nothing comparable had been produced in Europe before. When therefore in 1710, Augustus the Strong proudly announced the establishment of Europe's first porcelain manufactory, it was a major triumph for the Elector of Saxony and King in Poland. The Royal Manufactory established in the Albrechtsburg in Meissen was a unique trump card that distinguished him from all other European princes. Porcelain played henceforth a crucial role in the splendor of the Saxon Polish court. In a period of roughly 20 years, Augustus the Strong compiled the largest collection of East Asian porcelain in Europe. His collection once comprised almost 29,000 pieces from China and Japan. At first sight, it might seem surprising that the king spent such tremendous sums on porcelain from the Far East, since he could now produce his own porcelain in Meissen. However, it took two de decades before the highly complex and groundbreaking technology was developed to a degree that Meissen porcelain could actually rival the East Asian imports. In the beginning, the Meissen manufactory was more of a prospect, but such an auspicious one that Augustus the Strong had to place him forth. To distinguish himself from other European princes, Augustus the Strong did not plan to adorn a private cabinet in his residence with figures and vases on wall brackets as it was fashionable among princes and nobles at the time. Instead, he decided to dedicate an entire palace to his ever-growing royal collection of East Asian and Meissen porcelain. In 1715, he purchased the so-called Dutch Palace on the northern river bank of the Elbe for, his, for this purpose. In the following years, he ordered porcelain and other exotic wares like silks, lacquer cabinets and soapstone figures from Holland to furnish the pleasure palace in the Indian style. His porcelain collection was so extensive that he could decorate each room with porcelain of a different type and color as documented in the inventory book of the Dutch palace. We have to use our imagination to envision the colorful and varied interiors described in the inventory. The Chinese vases painted in red and gold, for example, stood on gilt brackets in front of black lacquer wall panels with colorful decoration. The white figures and dishes from Dechwa again were put against highly gilt lacquer panels, embellished with the Chinese figures in relief that were actually made in Saxony in imitation of East Asian examples. In contrast to the East Asian appearance of this room, the following room in the circuit, 
had a European character. The walls were clad with linen cloth and green and red, and colourful textile columns with carved capitals. Here, the white mice and porcelain was set on red lacquered consoles. The only preserved visual evidence of the earliest interiors of the Dutch palace document the feast held there on occasion of the princely wedding in 1719. When Crown Prince Fred Frederick Augustus married Maria Josepha, daughter of the Holy Roman Emperor, the dressed court catered the undoubtedly most splendid festivities of the Baroque era, which lasted for three weeks. The newspapers reported the amazement of the guests when all three courses were served on porcelain dishes. Even the handles of the cutlery was made of porcelain. To set the festive day table with porcelain was an absolute and somehow shocking novelty. Only Augustus the Strong allowed himself to expose his royal collection to such a danger, knowing that he would soon be able to replace all broken Chinese and Japanese pieces with the help of his own manufactory. Rather effectively, the king emphasized the unlimited availability of porcelain in Saxony that the Meissen manufactory promised. Ten years later, the Meissen manufactory could actually deliver what the king had anticipated. By then, it was capable of copying not only the smallest and simplest, but also the largest and most technically de demanding Far Eastern example. To demonstrate the newly achieved com competitiveness of the Saxon porcelain, the Dutch palace was extended to residence-like proportions with four wings surrounding an inner courtyard, the so-called Japanese palace. This unique palace for porcelain is depicted in a view of Dresden painted by Bellotto 20 years later, in 1748. The canvas shows the idyllic setting of the palace on the northern riverbank opposite the historic center of Dresden, where the Catholic church of the Dresden court was just under construction. The Japanese palace forms the focal point of the modern Baroque part of the town. Its signature pagoda roofs are the only reminder of the thousands and thousands of Chinese and Japanese porcelain pieces gathered inside. This 3D visualization gives an impression of how Augustus the Strong planned to display his porcelain collection within. The virtual reconstruction is based on detailed designs of the interiors. The king actually died before the building works were completed. The planned interiors were never executed. What remains is the facade made to designs of Jean de Bot in 1730, which suggested the intended message of the Japanese palace to the visitors even before they entered the building. At the center of the relief in the tympanum, Saxonia sits, sits enthroned in the shade of palm trees, already promising her victory. She looks downwards towards the Asians on her right who humbly present her with porcelain that they have brought with them from afar. On the other side, the Saxons approach with their vases and vessels. In complete contrast to the kneeling Asian woman, the personification of Dresden confidently places a foot on the first step leading to the throne. The facade thus anticipates the outcome of their competition that was supposed, supposedly carried out inside. The figures on the criteria just above the recumbent personifications of the rivers in the angles of the tympanum represent Asia and Europe. Consequently, the encounter in the tympanum develops into a competition between those two continents, which, at the time, were believed to be the most highly developed with 
Saxony, defending Europe's preeminence. Having entered the Chapman's Palace, the visitor first marveled at the quality and diversity of Augustus the Strong's Chinese and Japanese porcelain. The East Asian works, grouped according to types and colors in the rooms of the ground floor, set widely admired standards, which were to be outrivaled by the Meissen porcelain on the first floor. Stepping out of the stairwell into the gallery above the entrance, the guest would have first been confronted with something entirely new and without precedent even in China. The gallery was to house the complete menagerie of mostly life-size porcelain animals. These monumental works demonstrated what sex and genius, on the basis of European artistic principles, could shape out of the foreign material. Only 20 years after the establishment of the first European porcelain manufactory, the Saxons had brought this extremely complex technology to an astonishing summit that maximizes the material properties of porcelain. Augustus the Strong's visionary ambition and his merciless persistence were crucial for this outstanding achievement. When he placed the order for a life-size menagerie at Meissen in 1730, the manufacturers were shocked. However, when pointed out to the lack of kilns and adequate sizes, the king just asked to con construct bigger ones. Building kilns capable of heating up to the constant temperature of 1,400 degrees Celsius for many hours was in itself a groundbreaking achievement. This pelican demonstrates vividly Meissen's tour de force. For years, the manufacturers experimented with new clay compositions. At first, they added sand and marshal to lend more stability to the monumental figures during firing. As a result, the body turned grayish, as you can see at the unglazed parts of the back. Later, they added white ground porcelain shirts. The weight pressure of the irregular shades is deducted unevenly. This led to cracks during the firing process when the porcelain bodies shrank almost 20%. You can virtually see how the forces acted on the pelican. The upper part of the bag, for example, bent backwards, resulting in a gash in the face. These damages seemed, however, acceptable at the time. They were just filled with sealant where necessary. Most of the animals stayed white as additional firings and painted decoration were too risky. Johann Joachim Kenter designed the model of the pelican. Augustus the Strong had hired him at Meissen explicitly to create the royal porcelain menagerie. Trained as a sculptor of wood and stone, Kenter adapted himself very quickly to the plastic material of porcelain coping with its specific challenges. Very cleverly, he chose the moment when the pelican swallows a fish, which gave him the excuse to rest the heavy head on the back of the bird, as otherwise the long neck would have just bent during firing. At the same time, Kendler captured the pelican in a natural-looking attitude. Kendler's striking talent to represent animals vividly in their characteristic attitudes also becomes apparent in this pair of vultures, which he could observe in the royal aviaries in the park of the Hunting Palace Mobbetsburg, north of Dresden. His written work report reveals his fascination with the brute nature of animals. Obviously intrigued, he describes how one of the vultures snatches a cockatoo and devours its entrails, just the moment Kenta records in porcelain. 
Meistens monumental animal figures are still outstanding highlights of the Dresden Porcelain Collection and they are absolute favorites of our visitors. They found a new home in the Zwinger, another famous building of the time of Augustus the Strong, depicted by Bellotto in around 1750. This unusual architecture originally functioned as a backdrop for the ceremonial festivities staged on the central ground. In the late 1720s, while the Japanese palace was under construction, the Zwinger was remodeled as a science palace, housing the natural history and zoological collections, as well as the scientific instruments. In 1762, the light flooded galleries of the Zwinger provide a wonderful setting of the porcelain from China, Japan and Meissen of the Baroque era. In, two, in, 2000, then, in, two, in two, 2010, the New York architect Peter Marino redesigned the central hall dedicated to the Meissen animal figures. Lacking any visual evidence of how the animals were supposed to be displayed in the 18th century, Peter Marino took the liberty to create a modern interpretation of our opulence and exoticism. His bold gesture has, provo has provoked very different kinds of reactions, from sheer delight to absolute shock. Personally, I must confess, I find all our keens go somewhat too far. I feel that the magnificent white animal figures get lost among the gold and artificial rocks in the colorful trappings of the polar kings. In contrast, I find the presentation of the bird figures most successful. They are shown against a leather ball covering stamp, a leather ball covering stamped with a pattern that evokes a forest with the birds sitting among the branches. Leather ball papers were popular luxury features in the Baroque palaces and are still largely extant at Moritzburg Castle, for example. However, in the 18th century, they were never combined with porcelain. The choice of this material might be due to Peter Marina's personal predilection for leather. As a modern liaison, the handcrafted leather wall coverings still underline the value of the porcelain figures from Meissen. So far, I emphasize the de decisive role of Augustus the Strong for the foundation of the Dresden Porcelain Collection. You see here the monumental porcelain figure of the successor Augustus III with the traditional hair cut and dress of Polish kings. Like his father, he ruled over Saxony and Poland, Lithuania at the same time. One often reads that Augustus III preferred paintings to porcelain. His important patronage in this field becomes evident in the world famous Dresden Old Masters Picture Gallery. However, Augustus III was no less proud of the yet unrivaled Meissen manufacturing. Porcelain continued to play an outstanding role in the orchestra of the arts flourishing at the Dresden court. Augustus III just made a different use of this exceptional Saxon material, taking into consideration its changed perception. By the 1730s, Meissen and Porcelain had become an established and highly valued luxury good on the European art market. The completion of the Japanese palace interiors became somehow superfluous, as its main goal had already been achieved. The Meissen manufacturing had proven its competitiveness with the Asian prototypes. Its establishment assured that porcelain became a commodity in Europe, though still a very exclusive and prestigious one. Metaphorically speaking, porcelain migrated from the walls onto the table. Consequently, table services were made among the first orders, Augustus, from Augustus III, 
They were delivered to the court pantry and court kitchen instead of the Japanese palace. However, the first Meissen Royal Table services still reflect the competition with East Asian models through their painted decoration, the so-called red dragon and yellow lion patterns. These decors are direct copies of Japanese examples in the Kakimon style. The choice of these specific motifs among the many Meissen copies was by no means random. The Europeans were well aware of the symbolic meaning of the dragon in China. In one example, it is called the Chinese Imperial Coat of Arms in the historic imagery book of the Dresden Porcelain Collection. On the other hand, the lion was a traditional heraldic animal in Europe since antiquity. Of course, the lion is actually a tiger. However, in the historic documents, it's invariably identified as a lion. Hence, the two mice and table services destined for the courts in Dresden and in Warsaw, respectively, juxtaposed Chinese and European sovereignty. Augustus III dared to eat from tableware, bearing the sign of the Chinese emperor, as his royal manufactory had proven the quality, if not superiority, of Europeans in the Chinese art by excellence, the making of China or porcelain. In a very playful way, the handles of this unique terrain refer to the two main motifs of the first royal table services, the dragon and the lion. In my opinion, the terrain is a most charming example of Kendall's imagination and fine sense of humor. It also exemplifies how freely the Meissen artists transformed the Far Eastern example. The main benefit of a European porcelain manufactory was, however, that Europeans were now able to shape this exotic material according to their needs and aesthetic principles. The famous Meissen Swan service is an obvious example for this innovative approach to porcelain design. It was made for the Saxon Prime Minister, the Count von Brühl, and it originally comprised more than 2,000 individual pieces. In 1736, Kendler produced various example, sample plates proposing different design options. Brühl opted for the model whose surface completely dissolved in a relief pattern, reminiscent of rippled water or of shunts. A couple of swimming swans, a flying heron, and another heron standing in the midst of reed adorned the center of the plate. Based on the sample plate, Kendler and his joint modelers developed a rich variety of vessels with plastic applications referring to the core motif of water or sea. Nymphs riding on dolphins, for example, sit on the lid of this tree. Mermaids form the handles and intertwined dolphins form the feet. Two swans flank the cartouche bearing Bruce's coat of arms while the rippled surface of the terrain is encrusted with little snails and shells. Kendler conceives the vessels of the swan service as sculptures to be seen from all angles, and again he maxes out the plastic qualities of porcelain. At first sight, it might be surprising that the most important Meissen table service of the 18th century was, was made for Brühl and not for Augustus III. However, on highly ceremonial occasions, the king still dined from chilled side silver. In the ranking of the materials, gold and silver, with their high intrinsic material value, remained the truly royal attribute. However, of course, it was more fashionable and a much more and wide, unique feature of sex and Polish court. It was therefore the perfect choice for the table of Count von Brühl. 
when he received foreign envoys and guests on behalf of the king, he could dish up magnificently without outplaying his master and, at the same time, effectively highlight Meissen's transatic innovation in the court dining culture. The fact that Brühl received this table service at no charge from Meissen, from the Meissen manufactory, shows that Augustus III approved of Brühl's use of the table service, which promoted the success of the, his royal manufactory and increased demand for its products at once. Augustus III achieved a similar advertising impact with his well-placed royal gifts of mice and porcelain to various princes and high-ranking nobles. A beautiful example for this diplomatic practice is the part tea, coffee and chocolate service with the arms of Elizabeth Farnese, Queen of Spain, which the Dresden Porcelain Collection acquired in the early 20th century. In this case, the excellent painting stands out. In the perception of 18th century Europeans, Portland was still closely associated with the le legendary country of the materials origin. Fed by travel reports and a fascination with the exquisite import wares from the Far East, the image arose of a land of abundance where people lived in harmony, wealth, and leisure. The typical mice machine was reinker of Elizabeth Farney's service illustrates this idealization. With its rich gilding and personalized decor in the form of the recipient's coat of arms, the service for Elizabeth Farney's was a gift truly worthy of the Queen. Augustus III sent her the service in a specially made leather case together with 13 further sets and a garniture of vases after the highly prestigious marriage of his daughter Maria Amalia to the heir of the Spanish throne in 1738. In the cover letter, he proudly describes his gift as samples of porcelain manufactured in his patrimonial land. Having addressed Meissen's importance for an innovative table culture at the Dresden court as well as for the Saxon Polish diplomacy, I would like to point out another signature function of Saxon porcelain at the time of Augustus III. Just like his father Augustus III had converted from Protestantism to Catholicism in order to obtain the Polish royal crown. Unlike Augustus the Strong, however, he actually became a pious Catholic, just like his wife, the Habsburg Princess Maria Josepha. Both advanced the spread of Catholicism in Saxony, the country of Reformation. Both the king and the queen ordered several important religious altar garnishes from Meissen figures in groups for royal gifts or for their private devotion. In 1738, for example, Kendra received a copper plate from the royal court representing the death of St. Francis Xavier. The copper plate remained in the Dresden Kupferschi cabinet. It repeats a painting by Carlo Mahati in the Roman Chester Church in Chisholm. St. Francis Xavier was an early friar of the newly funded Cheswit Order. He acted as a missionary in Port Wales Far Eastern colonies in India, Malaysia, Indonesia and Japan. He died in 1552 on the passage to China. Augustus III and Maria Josepha choose this Jesuit missionary as patron saint of all of their 14 children. The transformation of the copper plate into a monumental three-dimensional porcelain sculpture confronted Cantor with a considerable challenge. A group of airborne angels on clouds forms the center of the composition. Kenta places the group on the edge of a hut, represented with dramatically resounding perspectives. 
The angels struck flowers on the recumbent body of the saint, who is surrounded by vot votaries. A commandant points the saint out to an evang evangelized native Indian. The death of Saint Francis Xavier uh, counts among the most complex groups ever executed in porcelain. Even more ambitious, however, is this Mestrian statue on a high pedestal surrounded by allegorical figures and works. It was presented to the king as a model for a larger than life monument, which would, would have measured around 11 meters or 36 feet. Kendler already suggested this almost megalomaniac project in 1734, only three years after his appointment in Mason. He was convinced that Saxon porcelain was a luxurious around material that could replace even bronze or marble. Work started only after the firm re-establishment of the Saxon Polish Union in 1751. The small-scale model dates from 1753. Four years later, the plaster models for the monumental execution were finished and stored in a spe specially erected timbered house. However, the outbreak of the disastrous Seven Years' War prevented the completion of the mon monument. Therefore, we cannot know whether this technically pioneering project was feasible at all. Yet, the model alone attests to Saxony's high-reaching ambitions associated with its monopoly in porcelain making. The allegorical figures on the rocks, an innovative addition to the traditional scheme of equestrian statues, represent princely virtues like piety, justice, justice and strength. In the middle of the long sides recline the river gods of Vistula and Alba, referring to the two countries governed by Augustus III. The riches of Saxon territory are represented by cornucopias bristled with grapes, flowers, gemstones, silver jewelry, and porcelain vessels. The relief on the pedestal above depicts Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and patron of the arts and sciences. You surely recognize the Catholic church, uh, court church in the background. Above all towers of Essence the third in Roman armor and a coveting horse riding over the figure of Henry. The monument is a multi-layered panegyrical praise of Augustus the third's reign. It also indicates a reference to the significant contribution of Mice and Porcelain to his glory. The vessels oozing out of the comic copia characterize porcelain as a product made of specific sex and minerals, local resources that were previously unexploited. Sex genius alone had succeeded in transforming this simple raw materials in a complex and secret process into a fine, wide and brilliant luxury material, much and wide in all of Europe. Augustus III, wise patronage of the sciences and arts, led to such an outstanding mastery in the production of porcelain that even an unprecedented monumental equestrian monumental statue could be made of this fragile material. Having introduced to you the history of the trust and porcelain connection and the different roles that Augustus the Strong and Augustus III played in its formation, I would like to conclude my lecture with glimpses into aspects of today's work of the trust and porcelain connection, including a look behind the scenes of the Weizen porcelain manufacturing. Besides the unfinished Japanese palace, the Dresden Court residence provided a second menu for the presentation of parts of the Royal Porcelain Collection, the so-called Tower Room, in the North Wing facing the Court Church. 
Nearby the State Department, as it was, the posting cabinet provided an unusually high profile setting for the royal collection and most notably for the best wares from the Meissner factory. The porcelain cabinet remained in the tower room with one or two changes for over 200 years. The earliest impression of the display of the porcelain pieces can be gained from a shot of the interior taken in 1896. The Dresden Palace was badly hit during the bombing of Dresden in 1945 and was almost completely gutted by fire. Only about one third of the porcelain pieces placed in the safekeeping outside of Dresden before the bombing were to be returned once the war was over. As part of the reconstruction of the porcelain cabinet, pieces originally exhibited in the tower room that had been damaged since the war were restored. In particular, the preserved examples of the so called elements vases. Kendall designed the innovative, extravagantly sculptural garniture in 1741 as a royal gift intended for the French king, allegorizing fire, water, air, and earth. Fire, for example, is represented by the father of all the gods of antiquity, Jupiter, who is seen riding on an eagle, hurling a lighting boat. In the richly peopled relief seen on the body of the vase, fire is equated with the art of war, the battle scene being flanked by Mars, and a fully modeled trophy of the spoils of war with weapons, armor, and military drums as a sign of victory. Chained to the foot of the vase is a captive figure whose hair and clothes cloth, mark him out as a native of the continent of America, colonized by Europe. The central laws again represents France, flourishing under the vice governance of Louis XV, who is seen in profile, framed with a laurel breath, adoring the bordered body of the vase. On the left shoulder of the vase sits Flora, goddess of spring, whose scattered flowers from a basket in allusion to the prosperity of the land of France. Hoovering over the right shoulder of the vase is Fama, proclaiming King Louis XV's undying glory with an instrument recorded as a trombone, which is now lost. Due to the extreme sensitivity during firing and the great haste with which these vast sets were designed and produced, leaving hardly any time for the necessary air drying of the bird pieces, each vast tire was, as a precaution, modelled several times. The production was incredibly fast. Ordered in December, the sets were completed in the following summer. But the political circumstances changed even faster. Augustus III had hoped to be able to assert his interests in the war of Austrian succession with the support of Louis XV. But the Prussian king Frederick the Great decided in his favor in June 1742 in a peace treaty with the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa. The splendid gift for Louis XV would not have been able to change this. Accordingly, the magnificent vases remained in Saxony and eventually ended up in the holdings of the Royal Porcelain Collection, from which a good number were selected to be displayed prominently in the tower room of the residence. Since World War II, these truly great masterpieces from the Meissen porcelain manufactory were kept in storage out of public sight due to their poor condition. In view of the reinstallation in the tower room, the porcelain collection restored 20 examples of vases fe uh, featuring the four elements. Even the minor blemishes of the exuberant figural modeling marred the overall effect engendered by the bulk of the silhouetted detail, details. 
Therefore, not only excellent fragments were reattached, but also all missing details were replaced. The fact that several examples of each vase type have been preserved facilitated their authentic reconstruction. The same applies for completely missing feet in this that the Meissen manufactory recreated after historic models. First, the clay models were made partly using preserved old forms, taking into consideration the shrinkage of the porcelain during firing. Therefore, the clay models are almost 20% larger than the original porcelain example. After cutting the clay model into pieces from which were created plaster molds, the individual parts were cast in plaster molds. The model carved out the details and put together the 31 separate pieces of the lid of the vase personifying fire with Jupiter riding on an eagle and hurling a lightning bolt. The lid was then fired at a lower temperature. Finally, the lid was dipped into a glaze that appears bluish before the final high firing at around 1,400 degrees Celsius. The restoration work at, uh, at the Tristan Palace will be completed by the end of 2025. The posting cabinet in the tower room will then also be reopened and the restored elements vases will be installed on both plinths in front of red lacquer walls up to the ceiling. So come and visit us then. The restoration of the elements vases allowed a look behind the scenes of the Western Porcelain Collection as well as the Meisenman Factory. To conclude my presentation, I would like to present a current research and digitization project of the Porcelain Collection. As these glimpses into our depots show, only a fraction of our collection can be shown publicly in the galleries of the Zwinger. For some years now, however, we have been devoting a great deal of energy to digitizing the entire collections and making them more accessible. We have been concentrating primarily on the historical collections of Augustus the Strong and Augustus the Third, which, despite numerous sales and exchanges in the 19th and early 20th century and major war losses, still contain more than 10,000 pieces from China, Japan and Meissen. What makes our collection unique in the world, and a reference collection of its kind, is the extensive documentation contained in three 18th century inventories that have been preserved, as well as other archival documents relating to purchases, orders, and their presentation at the Japanese palace. In addition, all pieces in the royal collection are meticulously marked with engraved or painted inventory numbers so that they can be identified even if they are no longer in Tristan. In order to make the entire historical Tristan collection and its documentation available to researchers, porcelain enthusiasts and the public, we have designed an innovative digital platform that went online at the beginning of this year, starting with 8,000 or so East Asian porcelains. The inventory catalogue was compiled by 35 specialists from China, Taiwan, and Japan, the USA, and Europe. At an international conference in 2018, all the authors and contributors met in Dresden to, stu to study the original works. The digital platform offers three different ways of accessing the vast collection. First, via a modern catalogue in which items are classified according to, cur to current scientific categories, each chapter and sub-chapter being accompanied by a scientific introduction. Second, via the digitized, transcribed and translated historical inventories, published for the very first time. And third, by means of visualized inventories in which the inventory records are accompanied by photographs of the preserved items, and spaces reserved for items that are missing today. 
The visualized inventories allow viewing the collection in its historical categorization. It is also possible to display images of items now in other public collections around the world in the reserved areas, allowing the historical collection to be reconstructed virtually, step by step. All the photos can be downloaded at any time, individually or collectively, also in high resolution, so that they can be used for publications or other purposes free of charge. Users have full rights to do so as long as they credit the museum and the photographer. They can also use them to print postcards or gift wrap. We would actually enjoy seeing our pieces spread around the world like this. And why not try it out yourself? This QR code will take you directly to our platform, the Royal Dresden Porcelain Collection. Well, it's time for me to thank you for your interest and once again invite you to visit us here in Dresden or to get in the mood also first in the digital room. So, a great thank you for your attention. Bye.